So our text this morning, Ephesians 4, 14 through 16, we'll pick it up at verse 11. These are the words of God. And now he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In our text this morning, that we would henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunningness and craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may we grow up in him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working and the measure of every part makes increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. Well, now let us be sure to take diligent heed to the commandment of the Lord charged to us this day, to love the Lord our God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave to him, to serve him, to love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul. Amen. Our title today, and I'll have to give more context to this uh, because it's more like a statement than a title, and I'll explain momentarily, but it is a biblical basis for why we are a confessional church. All right, we're still going to be working from our text today, but I've used the text today as a reason to help teach you uh, more of our approach to why we're the way we are as a church and so it's the biblical basis for why we are a confessional church now we'll look at three heads of thought here the first being the dangers of confessional unclarity that is immaturity if we're not clear on our doctrine uh, we will be totally immature tossed to and fro secondly uh, so that's the negative or the warning and then we're going to go to two Positives, that is the strength of confessional unity, that is we identify around the same truths. That's how unity is maintained. We all believe the same truth. There's no unity without believing the same truth. And then involvement, that unity produces involvement where every joint is supplying, everyone's growing together in love. Uh, we're speaking that truth that we identify with to one another in love. Making sense, everyone? So that's where we're going today, big picture. Uh, and that's what I would call confessional ministry or confessional service. The main point being that Paul is contrasting, so watch this, the fully mature Christian with the immature Christian. So he's now moving from what we should be to what we need to no longer be. So we should have been that person growing in the stature of the fullness of the measure of Christ. You don't want to be the person who's tossed to and fro following every wind of doctrine. And this is Paul's warning, not to separate yourself from the pattern of which Christ is building the true church through pure doctrine. Right, so it is a, a real sort of attention grabber here because uh, Paul's going in with a negative and he's coming out with a positive. He is warning them and then he is edifying them. Uh, he is showing them the problem and then showing them the answer. He doesn't want them to be children. He wants them to grow up. You can see that phrase there in the text. Uh, this morning in verse 15, speaking the truth in love that you may grow up. Verse 14, he's clearly calling them children. It's almost like a bit of a rebuke, isn't it? <laughs> no longer be children. That gives them a reason no longer. It's a choice they need to make. You should no longer be it's up to you. You can remain infantile and childlike if you want, but it's time to grow up. And I want you to see there, as you're having a look in your Bible, uh, I believe the, the text is pretty clear that the, in verse 14, the tossed to and fro is the negative, the positive. Have a look back in chapter 3, verse 17. Ideally, we shouldn't be tossed to and fro. We should be what? In verse 17 of chapter 3, we should be rooted and grounded in love. So there's the two differences. You're either rooted and grounded in truth, 
in God's church, in the body of doctrine that we believe, and you're living and walking accordingly, or you are tossed to and fro. All right, well, by way of introduction, I've used, uh, as you've noticed in the title, the term confessional church in the title. Now, by this, I don't mean that we are not a Reformed church. We are. All right? So we're certainly a Reformed church. But we also believe that God's Word is reforming and changing us. And that Word is a body of truth. It's a body of divinity. God's Word has the ultimate authority. No confession or creed trumps that. And so God's Word is always the standard. Amen, everyone? God's Word is always the standard in all we do as a church. Everything we do should align to Scripture. Another way of saying that we are Reformed is, of course, to say we're simply a biblical church that's continuing to go back to the Scriptures. You'll notice our stained glass window at the back there in the corner, one of them, it says Ecclesia Semper Reformata. It's the church continuing reform. We're continually going back to the Scripture, making sure we're getting it right. So... What do I mean? What do we mean when we say we're also confessional? We're also confessional, a confessional church. Well, it means that part of our biblical fidelity is that we hold to a confession of faith. That confession of faith describes our doctrinal convictions. All right, so a confession of faith, if you're writing it down, a confession of faith describes our doctrinal convictions. It's good to know what a church believes. You don't want to be going to a church for a year and find out you don't believe the Trinity, you don't believe Jesus is God. You know, this is crazy. Why didn't somebody tell me? You need to know uh, your doctrinal convictions. Now, by definition, because it is important that we do hold uh, definitions here, uh, to be a confessional church is to be a church that believes and confesses the word of God as summarized in the great creeds and confessions of the historic church. It is to be a church firmly rooted in the scriptures. So there's our definition now for us at Gospel Community Church. Our confession, of course, based from the scriptures and firmly rooted in the scriptures, is the London Baptist Confession of 1689 technically the second London Baptist Confession, uh, but that's our confession. And we've taught through that confession. Uh, We hold to that confession. I can teach nothing from this pulpit that deviates from that confession and the chapters contained within it. And a quick history lesson, everyone, uh, is that the London Baptist Confession actually came out of and was a more Baptistic version of the Savoy Declaration, all right, now, the Savoy Declaration in 1658, uh, the framers of that declaration were none other than men, formidable men like John Owen, Thomas Goodwin, William Bridge, Joseph Carroll, and William Greenhill, uh, among some of the uh, men there who uh, were really the framers of the Savoy Declaration. Of course, there is a long line of godly ministers who are in more recent history, used the London Baptist and still continue to use the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Of course, one of the uh, regular people I quote from in my sermons is uh, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon uh, was instrumental in uh, using this confession, as was the pastor he took over from, uh, Benjamin Keach. Now, I've got a picture here of the London Metropolitan Tabernacle, which... Uh, Spurgeon was instrumental in helping to build. And uh, I'm just quoting here from uh, Credo Mag magazine. Uh, They've documented that when Charles Spurgeon arrived at the New Park Street Chapel in 1854, that's the place they were meeting before, they were hiring before they they built their own building, he was glad to know that the church still had uh, held to the 1689 Confession of Faith. After all, commentator says here, Benjamin Keach, a former pastor, had played a leading role in its approval. However, 
Spurgeon soon learned that the confession had fallen out of use. So in 1855, uh, this is four years uh, before the actual uh, building is dedicated uh, to the Lord and begin, begins building, uh, Spurgeon works uh, with his publishers to reprint the Confession of Faith. He began to implement it in the life of his church. All the members received a copy. New Christians were led through a study of the Confession. Uh, the youth uh, of the church studied a catechism based on it. And when the laying of the foundation of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, all right, so this is a, a very rare picture I was able to find. Uh, and you can see there, that's the cornerstone of the laying of the foundation of that uh, building that you see up in front of you. Spurgeon placed his personal copy of the 1689 Confession along with a Bible under the cornerstone of that building. So it shows you that these caliber of men knew the value of confessional documents that summarize the doctrines we believe that are based out of scripture. You following me so far? I, I hope you are. This is a very important teaching, I believe, for us uh, this morning. I guess it's at this point that I would normally hear in a conversation about being a confessional church, well, I'm a Bible person. I don't need confessions and creeds. I'm a Bible guy. I'm a Bible girl. Well, you know, the Bible is certainly sufficient, uh, and the Bible uh, is obviously very, very important. But just remember, as a Christian, along with the Bible, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. Right? The Bible is not enough. I know that might shock some of you, but you need the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've seen in Ephesians 4 here, you also need pastors and teachers. You can't do it on your own. This idea that just me and Jesus, I got the Bible, I'm good, I think we need to really review that idea. Uh, I'm not suggesting anyone in the church would go with that. But God gives us aids and helps along the way. Church fellowship means a grace. And of course, I'm going to argue this morning that good biblical confessions like the uh, London Baptist Confession are also helpful as well. I like what Burke Parsons says here about creeds. He says, many Christians in the evangelical churches these days are confessionally challenged in that they are either cynical, critical, or altogether sceptical of all things confessional. Confessional documents, confessional churches, and confessional Christians. We might hear uh, confessionally challenged Christians say things such as, my only creed is Christ. Or, I don't need theology, just give me Jesus. Or, confessions divide, but Christ unites. Parsons says such Christians are actually under the impression that their churches don't have confessions, when in truth every church has a confession, though it may not be written down and though it may constantly change according to the whims and fancies of the pastor. So get the point there. Every church does have a confession, although they might not tell you what it is. Just look at the way they conduct themselves, what they teach, what they believe, and they have a confession, all right? They just might not be open about what it actually is. I mean, just as a little anecdote here, if you were ever moving interstate or needing to find a church in another location, uh, God forbid, but if you were, the first thing you would really need to look at with great discernment is not whether they have a kids program or great car parking or a youth ministry. No, you need to find out what their doctrinal confession is. What do they actually believe? Now, you may find that some churches will not state what they believe or it's written so broadly, so generally, we believe in Jesus. Well, what does that mean? I mean, there's a lot of different Jesuses out there uh, and we need to know the biblical Jesus. And so they're so broad, they could twist that confession of faith or that statement of belief and, uh, and do really what they want with it. This indeed is a concern for anyone in that sort of congregation. How can you possibly hold a pastor accountable for what they teach if they have no doctrinal guardrails to teach within? Right. Let's go to Charles Spurgeon. Now every Christian church should know what it believes and publicly avow what it maintains. It is our duty to make a clear and distinct declaration of our principles, 
that our members may know to what intent they have come together and that the world also may know what we mean. Okay, I've laid a pretty heavy foundation there because where are we going today is Paul's initial warning. What happens if you're not clear on what you believe? So let's have a look at it together. The dangers of confessional unclarity, immaturity. Or another word, everyone in your notes, instability, because you're tossed to and fro. Let's have a look at verse 14 together. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning and craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This instability... Uh, is certainly Paul telling us what we should no longer be. We know what we should be. It's back there in verse 13. We should be unified in the knowledge of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect, full-grown stature of the measure of Christ. And I would just say here that this is the type of person that teachers want to teach and pastors want to pastor. They're growing they're maturing, they're working, they're perfecting, they're members, they're serving, they're active. Uh, and, and to be honest, verse 14 is the exact type of person that's very hard to pastor and that's very hard to teach. All right, so I'm just going to say to you this morning, you don't want to be verse 14. All right? Uh, it's hard for me. It's even worse for you. So verse 14 uh, is really the opposite of verse 12. You know, the, perfect, uh, the perfecting of the saints, you're maturing, you're working, you're growing, you're edifying others in the body of Christ, you're contributing to the unity of the faith. Uh, I can think of the biggest challenge I've ever had in my pastoral career is pastoring unstable people. They're here one week, they're gone three weeks, uh, they turn up again a month later when they're in a crisis, uh, they'll call you in the middle of the night, and, and, and again, I'm not against, you know, emergency calls here, but, you know, don't show up to church for a month and then call me Saturday night before Sunday saying, you know, it's just, it's just craziness. You're living from emergency to emergency. And this is not the walk of the Christian, which is kind of consistent and walking upward. And we're working together on this, not, you know, tossed to and fro and emergencies and carried about and all these other things. So I think you get the point here. Paul's trying to show us as he moves from the ministers of the church in verse 11 from prophets and apostles who have laid the foundation, we know that, but now the edifying of the church is done through evangelists and pastors and teachers and now he's moving to the members of the church and he's talking to them and he wants to show us what it looks like if we're not pastored or taught and we just flitter around and do our own thing. We're not in a a member of a church, we're kind of just doing our own thing. And he's really painting a scary picture of what the end result looks like. Have a look at it with me. I mean, the wavering, infantile, gullible Christian. It's scary, isn't it? <laughs> wavering, infantile, gullible, just getting sucked into everything. I mean, these people are easy bait for these men who are lying in wait to deceive. It's like a trap. I know where I'm going, but the church doesn't know. They're, they're gonna, I'm going to drag them along with me. I'm going to get them you know, doing this, saying this, giving this. Uh, I know what I'm doing, but they don't really know. It's all trickery. It's cunning. It's all sleight of hand. And Paul's deliberate in his use of terminology here as he's warning the members of the Ephesian church. And don't think these guys haven't had good teaching. They've had Paul teaching them. They've had Timothy teaching them. I mean, they've had good teaching but you can still go wrong. So it's a warning for us, just because you've got good teaching, uh, it's not no um, you know, uh, protection that you can't fall into this sort of stuff. What are we called to be? Well, of course, Christ-like, proverbial pillars, biblical convictions that we hold within the house of God, we're to be firm and unmovable. Of course, this is the challenge uh, that happened with Paul in Corinth as well, as he said to them, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4. I'll read it for you. It's up on the screen. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but as to carnal and babies in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat. Up until now, you couldn't even handle it. Fancy that. Paul's saying, look, I wanted to teach you, so you couldn't even handle it. 
had to sort of lower it down here. And that is the concern of you know, people that are teaching always low. I'm always teaching to the lowest common denominator. That is not what Paul's saying the church should be doing. We should teach to the highest common denominator. And I'm not, when I teach here, I'm not trying to think I'm better than you. I'm actually wanting you to go, wow, I've got a lot more to learn. All right? So that's the idea of teaching meat, not milk. Although you do need milk to grow, technically you need both. And in that order, milk then meat. And he goes on and says, you're carnal because you're envying and striving. There are divisions. Uh, you walk as men choosing Paul over Apollos and Paulus over others. Are you not carnal? Of course, the word here in verse 14, everyone, is do no, no longer be children. Nepios. And it means, uh, nepios means somebody who cannot talk for themselves. Listen to that for a minute. A child is somebody who cannot talk for themselves, unable to talk. Now, we know infants, for a certain period of their very younger life, cannot talk, can they? They can't string a sentence together. They start with word by word, mum or dad or help. or um, And before that, it's just noises. So we know that Nepios uh, is going to be, they can't speak for themselves. Now, we know in verse 15, Paul's using Nepios, to represent the fact that they can't speak the truth. Now, they might speak their own opinion, but they can't take the Bible and take that truth and apply it to their own life in a mature way. Having discerned and knowing truth, discerning both good and evil, applying it. They're not able to speak the truth in love to one another. They're infants. And often you'll find with immature Christians, children in the faith, they don't know the word of God well enough to apply it to their own lives and to even challenge their own spouse, or their own husband or wife, uh, their own children, and they're just led along by every wind of fad of doctrine of what they think is best rather than led by the word of God. Are you getting me, everyone? That's what Paul's really trying to say here, the spirit of the text. They're unenlightened. They don't have the truth in a way that they can speak it. Now, we know that you know something well when you can teach it or you can speak it out with confidence. And that's where Paul's going here. Don't just read your Bible. Know it well enough to speak it to others, to rebuke, to correct, to exhort one another. Um, and of course, uh, for many of us, this starts in our own homes. All right. Now, although these uh, people cannot speak, they're children, uh, they're also giving way to other things. They're being deceived by the tricks of false pastors. Despite having access to great teaching previously and access to the word of God, these saints are immature and childlike. And they're giving, by the, the feel of the text here, they're giving room for uh, fake pastors to come in. The slight of hand, the slight of men and the cunningness and craftiness of those who are waiting to deceive. They're giving a ready hearing uh, to these men maybe financial support uh, to an unlimited group of untrained, misdirected, corrupted, heretical, appointed, self-appointed leaders. Now, these men are going to do more damage than good, deceiving God's people with their sleight-of-hand tactics. Now, the verse for us where Paul then goes on in his second book to the Corinthians to rebuke them by tolerating such fake pastors he said, you gladly bear or put up with these fools, you thinking yourself wise? For if you bear, uh, you bear it. If somebody makes you a slave, they make slave of you or devour you or take advantage of you. They put on airs or graces and they strike you in the face. 2 Corinthians eleven nineteen 19 and 20. I mean, Paul's really having a go at the false apostles there who were taking in the Corinthians to believe their teaching over Paul's. The picture Paul's painting here is the Christian who is really gullible, unstable, and constantly vacillating because they're not rooted and grounded in truth. They're tossed to and fro, and they're unable to anchor themselves on what they truly believe. What are your convictions? What are you willing to stand on? What are you willing to die for? What are the gospel issues you will never compromise? They just simply don't know them. And so they just go with what is taught, what is handed to them. Having no firm grounding of sound doctrine contained in God's word, 
They are like waves, as James described, tossed to and fro, double-minded, unstable in all things. They should never expect a response from the Lord. Uh, Romans 16, 17, watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. What should you do? Turn away from them. There's no options there. If they're creating alternate teaching that contradicts the truth that you have learned and that you know is true of Scripture, you must turn away from them. John MacArthur put it this way, because they are not anchored in God's truth, they are subject to every sort of counterfeit truth, humanistic, cultic, pagan, demonic, or whatever. There are three words that um, Paul uses for the way these men operate. They're very interesting Greek words. Let's have a look at the first one, scheming. You can see that's where we get our word methods from, methodia. They're using different types of methods. Uh, this is the same verse in chapter 6, verse 11, that the devil used. This is the schemes of the devil. So these are demonically, most likely led men who are coming up hatching strategies to try and keep you hooked. What method can we use next to keep them going? It's the old carrot stick trick. It's never changed, has it? It's how Satan works with temptation. Oh, look, something glittery. Gold, the girls, the glory. It's the same tricks in the book. We're not ignorant of his schemes, everyone. His methodia, his methods. And of course, these men have methods. You only need to watch uh, and look at some of these uh, gospel prosperity teachers. It's the same wheels that are turning to keep people uh, on, the, on that you know, spinny wheel that the rat's running around. And it, in the end, if you still win the rat race, you're still a rat, right? So it's not worth it. Let's look at the next one. This gets more interesting. Cubia. Yes, trickery. It's where we get our word cube from. And this is the ancient game of dice. All right, now we've all played board games. We've all spanned dice. Hopefully you've not been to casinos and lost a lot of money. But, you know, we know... Uh, historically, the odds are in the favour of the, the house. Why? Because certain things are loaded. You know, those uh, slot machines are they're set up a certain way, aren't they? And the word cubia here, uh, from the ancient setting, is si similar. It's where the dice were loaded. And a good dice uh, trickery cunning person would have, and you wouldn't know it, but they would have two different dice in their hands. And they would spin, give one to the person who didn't know it, and they would have, or the other one's loaded, they would give, and they would then keep the other one. They would have two sets concealed, and this is really manipulating, all right? The aim here is to manipulate the Word of God. So here's the true dice, here's the real dice, but watch what I say now that's loaded, all right? that's going to deviate from what this is actually saying. That's where Paul's going here. They scheme of how they can twist the word of God to make you think it says something that it doesn't say. They're using loaded dice. And then thirdly, energia, craftiness. Uh, this it comes from a word, uh, all and ergon. They're working all types of ways, and that includes leading to the unprincipled ways. They're men willing to do anything to keep you on the hook. Technically, they are capable, in the Greek, of doing anything in an unprincipled way. Now, I am sorry if this is bringing up certain previous pastors to you, but this is a good thing. This should warn us. That this is what Paul is telling the Christians to be aware of. Now, these men, in verse 14, lie in wait. All right? They're watching you. And they're waiting for their opportunity to roll the dice, to teach certain things. So they may call themselves a pastor, a teacher, a healer, an evangelist, a prophet, an apostle, but these men are very dangerous. And this is why Paul is highlighting it. He wants these Christians to be rooted and grounded in truth. And a deliberate inability to reject or to grow or to learn and follow these irreverent and silly myths um, rather than these uh, Christians training themselves in righteousness and maturing, which is their responsibility, everyone. 
I can't make you mature. I can teach good sermons. I can teach you truth from the scripture, but I cannot make you mature. That's your commitment. You've got to be committed during the week to be reading and praying and sowing and serving your lives into the word of God and into the means of grace. And, you know, John Calvin's really blunt here. He simply says of these Christians that were unwilling to mature, he said, it is their just punishment for looking not to God, but to man. Let's go to point two. Let's look at the remedies now. We've looked at the immaturity, but let's look at how we can remedy this. So we've got the strength of confessional unity, identification. What does Paul say? Well, let's have a look at it in verse 15. He says, but, so here's the remedy. The word but is the juxtaposition here. It's the segue. But speaking the truth in love. Speaking is in the continuous. So keep on speaking the truth to one another in love that you may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ. Now I want you to see this. We are not just to know the word, we are to speak it to one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we're told to exhort one another, to encourage one another in the truth. You should speak your convictions. You should voice your convictions. You should let your spouse or your mem other fellow members in the church know that we believe this and what you're doing is contrary to what we believe. We speak the truth to one another and truth equals growth. That's how we're going to grow as we speak the truth to one another. My hope is that I preach and teach the truth to you today that from it you will grow. You will hear the word of God. You will receive the word of God. You will take the word of God and apply the word of God and walk in truth. It's how it works. But I'm not the only person in this church who should speak truth. Amen, everyone? We should speak truth to one another in love. Now, younger people here today, if your parents are trying to guide you and rebuke you and correct you, you should listen. They're speaking the truth to you in love. As a pastor, if I go up to somebody and I'm concerned about their soul and I'm trying to point some things out from Scripture, I'm doing it in love because I care about them. If I didn't care, I wouldn't say anything. Oh, just go. I don't care. Well, that shouldn't be my attitude. My attitude should be, I do care, and I love you, and so I'm going to say something. All right, I know my wife has my permission. If she sees something that concerns her, she can speak the truth to me in love. Right, everyone? Now, husbands, I don't think any of us are good enough that we can say, because our wives know us very closely, that they can't say something to us. So this is how it works. We speak the truth to one another. We confess, we hold each other honest to our confession. Now, what this more accurately means, if I could sort of, I mean, we don't have time to go to interlinear stuff today, but literally it means more accurately, truthing one another in love. Did you get that? We truth one another in love. Now, in your Bibles, chapter 4, go with me from verse 15, because Paul's going to bleed this into the next few verses, so... Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Did you get that? So this is more of the same. Each one of you has a responsibility. Now go down with me to verse 29. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouths, but only that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. That's how to speak the truth in love. All right? Only truth is going to edify and you make sure you're doing that to one another. Of course, Christ is our example because he is the truth. I am the way, the truth, the life. That's why we're growing up into him because he is the exemplar of truth. He is the prototype. He is the ultimate example of truth. So how do we truth one another? Well, we've looked at some verses, but really, the Bible teaches here, and I'm just going to go to a verse in Hebrews 4.14 and 10.23, hold fast your confession. I mean, that is really a biblical text to say we should be confessional. Hold fast your confession. The confession is the body of doctrine you believe. 
So why are we a confessional church? Isn't the Bible good enough? Well, as we've said before, of course, the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is good enough. And it's a good question. Isn't the Bible good enough? Of course the Bible's good enough. But let me clarify that no confessional creed, again, overrides the Scripture. The Scripture always has the final authority for our worship and practice. However, please listen, the Bible is a big book. It's a big book. And it isn't written in a way that the doctrines that are found within that are always made clear. Therefore, there is a need for the church to have a document derived from the scriptures that succinctly explain all the key doctrines of scripture to make them easy to locate, understand and acknowledge that is confess in practice. Wherever a confession or a creed deviates from Scripture, it should be thrown out. So confessions are helpful from that perspective. Now the Bible expects that we know its standards on all of its main points and lives according to them. Have a listen. That there is a standard of teaching, verse six, uh, Romans 6.15, to which we need to be committed and a pattern of sound words, 2 Timothy 1.13, that need to be handed down, 2 Timothy 2.2. All right, now I can tell you that in the early church, there is a document, you can look it up for yourself, it's called the Didache. The Didache, and it is the, like a one-page A4 document it prints out as, and that is the early sort of confessional statement of the church, what they believed, what they held to. So this has been going on since, you know, literally the early church days. So then I need to sort of lead on here because we're a confessional church and I need to unpack what this looks like so that we identify with this confession and how it contributes to our unity. So how does the London Baptist Confession help us practically? Well, why can't I just look up some Bible passages? Well, you can and you should, but the confession has done all that for you by men that are greater than all of us can mind. Uh, They've taken the time to combine all those references into one place around the key doctrines of the faith that that show us these doctrines as a whole. One minister, and I'm going to use his example, used this illustration of how to explain to his congregation why their confessional document was so helpful to them in their membership. I'm going to give you an example here. He says, if the Bible is the mountain... You and your church are scaling together. The confession is the trail map. Indeed, the Bible is like a mountain. It's extremely big and a beautiful book. It alone is the authoritative word of God. A confession is a map. It does not detail every bush or tree, every rocky crag, every beautiful vista that you'll experience while scaling the mountain. But don't you feel better if when you meet someone to hike up a mountain, you can consult the same map as them and hopefully say, oh yes, I see, that's the way over there. Or, oh no, that looks like that way turns out pretty badly. At times when you might have questions or doubt the path you're on, it's a great comfort when your trail mate says, oh yes, I've printed off a map, here you go, let's have a look at it and continue on our way together. In this way, I hope you begin to see your church's confession in a similar light. It's a promise from pastor to their members as travel companions and also something members can hold their pastors to as you might pull, uh, sorry, as you might pull your trail guide aside if needed and say, but doesn't the trail actually turn that way? End quote. Of course, as we've already discussed, every church has a confession. Every church is confessional. They all hold a pattern of teaching, even if it's a false pattern of teaching. The difference between those churches and this church is that we are deliberate. And we've deliberately chosen and subscribe and adhere to a confession that is transparent, that is in the line of a long godly tradition and you know what the baseline is for the teaching from this pulpit. We've deliberately nailed our colours to the mast, haven't we? Right? And I think that's very, very important. Let's go to point three. 
the growth of confessional ministry, that is, involvement. Now that we all identify with the same truths, we can now serve together in the same spirit with those same truths that join us together. Let's go to verse 16. This is certainly where Paul's taking it, everyone. He says in verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working and the measure of every part makes increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. Again, the reference there in love is linked to the truth that's being taught. Uh, Paul is uh, clearly encouraging the members now uh, to get involved, to get involved. This is certainly to me pointing to membership because he's saying every joint, every part, everyone's playing a part. So I think that's uh, where it's really going there in the text. Paul starts uh, in verse 16 there, from whom that is Christ, who is the head, who is the sum of all truth. So this is only coming from Christ. And it works in a way that we speak the truth, we apply the truth, we truth one another in love, in the Spirit, and the Spirit uses this to increase, to edify. He uses your efforts, your work, as every joint supplies, works, ergon, in the bond of love, in the truth. This is healthy behaviour as a church. It's not just me doing all the work, it's all of us doing all the work together. Yes, the minister, the pastor, the elder should oversee the work, of course, alongside the deacons. We, we understand these things. Of course, that's all outlined in the confession as well, but every joint must find their place. Now, this is a challenge for each one of us because we don't want you to be spectators, to be watchers, to be attenders. We want you to be members. We want you to be involved, finding your gifts, practically outworking them, as the Lord has joined you to his church. Paul's clear, every part, every joint, every ligament, he's using physiological language here deliberately. Why? I believe it's because every part of your physio physiological makeup is important. God gave you a liver for a reason. He gave you eyes for a reason. He gave you toes for a reason. He gave you a nose for a reason. Every part is valuable. So, dear saint, you're valuable. Don't say to yourself, look, everything's covered here, I'm good, I won't do anything. That is not biblical thinking, uh, and I'll truth you in love for that one. Because you are to be involved, uh, and you are to be serving. Your job is to find out where you're gifted. And, of course, go back with me, everyone, to verse 7 of chapter 4. Paul says, but to everyone of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift. So you've all got grace, you've all got gift. Paul encourages three things here. Firstly, every joint is fitly jointed. I see this, of course, as the local church, the whole body being joined together. Interestingly, the, the Greek word here is sunamologio. The sun comes from the word sin, which means synergy or synergistic, it means together. And logio means confession, logos, words. So when we are synergized together around the words or teaching we believe, we are fitly joined together. Does that make sense, everyone? This is why confessions are important. Because when we believe the same thing, we're closer, we're more unified. This is why organizations in the world have to have a, a mission or a vision statement to identify people that are losing track, they're losing focus, they've, you know, they've got scope drift. Secondly, every member effectually works. That is stewardship, ministering your grace and your gift, finding your place of service in the local assembly. And then thirdly, the faithful service of your gifts strengthening the church, all right? So it ends in edification. And this is a real challenge for us because you've got to ask yourself, how is my uh, involvement in my local church helping build the body of Christ? Because we all play a part in that edification process, making increase. You know that when you go to meet the Lord and you're judged, 
Your sins won't be judged. They were judged in Christ, but your stewardship will be judged. And the Lord will say, as he said to the parable of the talents to the stewards, what did you do with what I gave you? Did you make increase? And remember the Lord said to the unfaithful, you could have at least put it in the bank. It would have at least made some interest. You could have done something with it. So this expectation that we would do something with what we're given is so, so critical. I mean, what is Paul going for here? Every member ministry. No passive Christianity here. He wants active members, not passive attenders in the Ephesian church. In his mind, the only way the church will be strengthened and edified as it should from the ground up is active members truthing one another in love. Active members truthing one another in love. And let's just set the ground rules, everyone. If somebody comes with scripture to you, we know they're doing it in love and we should embrace it. All right, the godly man, the book of Proverbs says, the godly man or woman loves the rebuke. They love the rebuke. Why? Because they're given perspective from God's word from that other brother or sister. You should be able to speak the truth. I mean, we live in a world where we just want to say everything is good and we want to be politically correct, don't we? But we need to be able to tell the truth to one another in love. I mean, we're heading into times in this world where we can't afford to dilly-dally around with one another, tiptoe around the tulips with, oh, I don't really want to say it, I don't want to offend them. If it's truth, they should never be offended, ever. We need to be bigger than that, don't we? I mean, we could go to the book of Romans, Corinthians, uh, every member, one of another. Uh, we're all in the body of Christ, serving, encouraging, uh, provoking one another in love. And as for our own London Baptist Confession, let's hear what it says. Chapter 26, verse 12. As all believers are bound to join themselves to particular churches when and where they have opportunity so to do, so all that are admitted to the privileges of the church are also under the censures and government thereof according to the rule of Christ. So that's the confession saying, you just can't have all the blessings of the church and not get involved in service. You've got to do both. Secondly, chapter 26, verse 8. A particular church, that is a local assembly, gathered and completely organised according to the mind of Christ, consists of officers and members. So there you go. That's why we have formal membership in our church. I'm an officer. That is the fivefold ministry of which we now have evangelist pastors, teachers. And of course, we have the office of deacon as well uh, in the life of the congregation. Appointed by Christ to be chosen and set apart by the church. 26.6, the members of these churches are saints by calling. So all Christians are saints, but not all saints are members. Do you get that? There's a differentiation here in the confession. They're visibly manifesting and evidencing in and by their profession and by their walking. So you don't honour the profession anymore or you don't walk according to it. We will church discipline you and you will lose your membership. Does that make sense, everyone? So you need to walk according to it in their obedience to the call of Christ and do willingly consent to walk together according to the appointment of Christ, giving up themselves to the Lord and to one another by the will of God in professed subjection to the ordinances of the gospel. This is what the gospel expects of us, to lay our lives down for one another as Christ laid his down for us. Of course, for membership to have any meaning, there's got to be some gravitas to it. Well, yeah, I believe in meaningful membership. I just don't think you should put a signature on a roll and I'm a member and I live how I want. I think there are expectations. Of course, if you think about it, a pastor should know who their members are who are serving and representing on behalf of the church. So why? A, because there is an account to be given for them on the day of the Lord. B, if they are to represent or serve on behalf of the church, we should know who they are. And C, if they're having a direct influence into the members' lives or other members' lives, we should know them. We should know who they are. Let me be clear. If you're a Christian, you are a member in the body of Christ spiritually. You get that, everyone. So all born-again Christians are members in the body of Christ spiritually. 
But if you attend a local fellowship, an assembly of believers, you really need to decide at some point at what level you intend to steward what God has given you in that congregation locally. You're getting me, right? And I'm preaching to the choir here for most of you. All ministry must start and be proven in the local church. I'll give you the, the scripture. You're to do good first and foremostly to those who are a part of the household of faith. That's where it's proven. Because the truth is proven in the pillar and the ground of truth, the local church. That's why we have that scripture up the back there. The pillar and the ground of truth. We won't deviate from that. So at Gospel Community Church, clearly we obviously have formal membership, just as there are set criteria for what the gospel is and isn't, just as there are set criteria to admit you to the Lord's table, just as there is set criteria for baptism, uh, there is set criteria for membership. Uh, each church has general curricula that they can take from or expectations from of the Word of God for their membership. Uh, here at Gospel Community Church, you must be, have been fellowshipping with us for 6 to 12 months. That really is us to get to know you, you get to know us, that honeymoon period if you like. Uh, we also have the fact that we would want to know in that time that there are actually fruits to you, you're actually a Christian, you know, you're actually living and walking a Christian life, that you're not just saying one thing and we admit you into membership the week after and you know, gets messy from there. You're water baptised, you'll sign our membership document. And by the way, everyone, our membership document uh, is a two-page document and it has a scripture next to every line I've written, a basic Christian conduct. All right, basic Christian conduct. And look, if you can't sign a membership covenant uh, saying that you actually acknowledge those scriptures as a Christian, then that's okay. Uh, but clearly that's what we'd expect uh, in membership here and of course you would acknowledge your uh, um, adherence or subscription to the London Baptist Confession. Now I would say you don't have to believe every single thing in it minutely, you might vary on different things, uh, just let me know what that is and I'm fine with that as long as it's not a point of difference and then you don't make that difference a point of division in the church. All right? So you can differ on some slight things in the confession and still be a member in this church. Now could you be uh, a Methodist and believe in infant baptism and still be a part, uh, a member of this church. Uh, that's a longer conversation and we haven't had that happen yet because we don't believe in infant baptism, we don't believe it's in scripture. But you could be somebody who is involved in the church in a way that you attend and you serve and you give in a, in a very fringe way but you've, that confession is very important to us. And look, there are other churches that do believe in infant baptism and you should just fellowship there. We still love you. And finally, everyone, you would have a discussion with me just to confirm, hey, here's where I'm going. I uh, want to put my hand up. want to get involved and so forth. All right, so obviously I'm winding up the message here now. It ends very practically because uh, I think the way to teach this sermon was to show that we have structure around how we get everyone involved, how we truth one another and, uh, and to be be aware of that. So if you are interested uh, in our confession of faith, I've got some copies up the front there. I think there's seven or eight copies. And uh, again, if you're genuinely interested, you, you could look at the e-version uh, online if you want a copy for yourself. This is my church. This is you know something I'm serious about. You should take a copy for your family, a copy for yourself. We've taught through this before. The sessions are all online at our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're interested in membership, I've got printed copies of our church covenant. Just come and take one. It doesn't mean you've got to become a member, but you can at least read through it and see what it looks like, and you would come back to me with that if you were interested. We also have on our church website an article, Six Reasons Why We Are Serious About Being a Confessional Church. All right, Six Reasons Why We Are Serious About Being a Confessional Church. And I'd love for you to read that as well, just to grow in that, because this is obviously uh, the way we're heading and very important that uh, you're aware of these things and why we're this particular way. Of course, if you've got further questions, I'm happy to chat with you 
after uh, the sermon, uh, any of the contents, uh, comments and so forth. Well, please hear me. Uh, if you attend this fellowship, member or not, we love you. All right? So this is not about a membership drive. This is just unpacking, using this text of scripture, why being a confessional church is so important. But we love you either way. You need to know that if you're a Christian, we love you. But the pathway, obviously, to active service in the life of this church is through formal membership, acknowledgement of our confession. My prayer today is that this sermon has provoked you to consider our confession of faith and to take seriously how you intend to steward God's gifts and graces in your life for his glory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God in heaven, thank you that you're a God of truth. And may the truth of your word cause us to grow up into your son, into his full stature and measure. May we know the truth and speak the truth to each other in love. May we each determine not to be like children, tossed to and fro, being so easily deceived by fake men of God, but rather looking to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth, that we may follow and grow up into him. Lord, we offer a prayer of repentance this morning, that you would forgive us when we have wavered and listened to lies, when we haven't been men and women of biblical conviction. Give us ears only for your truths. May they lead us as a church into unity and maturity in Christ. Help us to realise that we are to be active members in your body, of which you are the head. And now, Lord, would you grant us grace to embrace these truths that we have heard this day. We pray in your son's precious name. Amen.